If you brought your Bibles, if you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to do what Lynn did. We're going to begin with a quiz. What did we talk about last week? Yeah, never mind. All I know is there's a bowl in the foyer. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for Paul. We thank you for the various experiences of his life which fitted him to the purpose and the uh, position to which you called him. Lord God, help us to remember that all of the things that have occur occurred in our lives, all the experiences that we've had, also equip us to serve you. Father, this scripture is authoritative, it's canonical, uh, it, it is your word to us. Help us to hear it. Help us to listen, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So the last few weeks, we're working our way through the epistles, and in 1 Corinthians, there is, uh, he, he's done chapter 5, sexual immorality, chapter 6, sexual immorality, porneia, or all those good King James words, lasciviousness and debauchery and concupiscence. Um, so we can say those words. Those are okay to say. Um, and now... If you look at verse 1, chapter 7, verse 1, now concerning or now about the things about which you wrote. So they have sent Paul a letter, and in the letter they're asking dear Abby, dear Paul, to answer some questions that they have. And sadly, we don't have the list of questions. We have his answers. So we have to guess and infer what the question was from the answer that he gives. And so we work our way down through most of the chapter. Primarily, he's dealing with questions about marriage, questions about virgins, questions about widows. Um, and he's giving practical advice. And then he gets to our text this morning, verses 29 through 31, and he begins to wax poetic. It doesn't really fit in the context of, of what he's doing. Paul gets carried away like this all the time. It's either a doxology of praise to God, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he just starts, he, you know, then he returns to the argument later, but he gets carried away. Here he's got a little poem that he gives, um, and we'll get to that in a moment. But they're writing to Paul. Now Paul's no longer their pastor. Paul has left Corinth, and the new pastor is Apollos, and Apollos is an educated man, but not in the same way that Paul is. So they've got questions, they go back and they send a letter to Paul, Paul help us to understand, help us what's going on. In his formative years, Paul grew up in Tarsus, a pagan city. He went to the university in Tarsus and so he got a pagan education. Pagan meaning Greek, Greek culture, Greek uh, tradition, Greek understanding of the world. So Paul's got this Greek background and then at about the age of 20 he moved to Jerusalem and he apprenticed himself to Gamaliel. Uh, he was one of the two chief rabbis in Jerusalem at the time, so it was Harvard and Yale, and he went to Harvard instead of Yale, and he apprenticed himself to Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a well-known, renowned uh, teacher of the law. He was a Torah expert. He served on the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, and Paul apprenticed himself to Gamaliel, Acts chapter 22, verse 3. And so he spent 10 years studying and learning, and with his characteristic enthusiasm, poured himself wholeheartedly into the study of the law and the traditions of Judaism. Uh, and he spent about 10 years as a Pharisee. Now it's about, he's about 30 before his conversion, and before then he begins to um, evangelize or to church plant or to be an apostle, uh, be one who is sent with the good news of the gospel. Now this background is very disparate. There's the Greek pagan world, there's the Jewish world of the Torah, and not just that he's a Jew, but also that he is a Pharisee. Um, so he is well versed in both, which enables him to speak to the Jewish folks and their traditions and their backgrounds, and also it enables him to speak to the Greeks. And in his letters, he kind of intersperses and weaves ideas from both groups in the things that he writes to them so that they can understand uh, better the gospel that he is proclaiming. So we get to chapter 7 verse 29 and Paul says, this is what I mean. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on let those who have wives live as though they had none, those who mourn as though they were not mourning, those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, those who buy as those who had no goods, back and forth, back and forth. And it's 
Hebrew parallelism. And it is that, but it's also Greek philosophy. It's Stoicism. And so he's taking these ideas from both cultures and blending them together. Uh, Epictetus had a hero. His hero was Socrates. And about Socrates, Epictetus was a Stoic philosopher. He says of Socrates, look at Socrates, look at his example. Though he had a wife and children and kin and country, uh, he did not hold on to them uh, in, a, in a death grip, but he held them loosely. And if his country was attacked, he was the first one to sign up as a soldier. And as a soldier, he was the first one to place himself in the most dangerous situations. Um, Stoicism is this understanding that your life, that your reason overcomes your feelings and your passions and your emotions. And so you think things through and you don't respond emotionally to the things that come at you. And Seneca, and I believe he was a Roman philosopher, but also a Stoic, he's talking about your earthly goods. Don't hoard your earthly goods as if they've been given to you for safekeeping. Because the second that you lose them, you become bereft and you mourn over these things that don't matter. How many of you have a storage locker in addition to your garage? Come on. There's nobody in this room with a storage locker. I don't believe it for a minute. We're Americans. What kind of Americans are you anyway? Everybody's got a storage locker. We got stuff and stuff and stuff. We moved in here eight years ago. I got boxes in the garage I haven't opened in eight years, but they're not going anywhere. Now, that's not stoic. So he's blending these ideas, and he's saying to the Jews, OK, you're married, but act as if you're not married. You're mourning. Your mother died, but act as if you're not mourning. Again, reason trying, triumphing over emotions. But from the Jewish background, he's saying, have, have an eternal perspective. It, there's more to life than just this world. Peter, in his first epistle, says, you are strangers and aliens in this world. Don't make yourself at home here. Don't act as if this is where you're supposed to be and put down roots. Act as if, if you have a wife, as if you don't have a wife. Act as if you're mourning your mother, as if you didn't have a mother. Um, but, but look at the eternal picture, not just the carnal. So he, he's, it's a... He's talking about marriage, he's giving advice, and now he's saying, okay, all this practical stuff is well and good and important, and we need to know that stuff, but don't hang your hat on this world. Don't be practical atheists, because when you do that, you, you basically deny that there's a God and that he has plans and purposes for you and for this world. That's what he's trying to get at. Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater, had a wife and couldn't keep her. Put her in a pumpkin shell, and there he kept her very well. Uh, that, that's what Paul's saying right there. Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater. Um, don't, don't hang your hat on all of that. You read his little poem here in 29 through 31, and it sounds a lot like Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon has this phrase he uses over and over again, under the sun, under the sun. Under the sun is what takes place in the earthly realm, in the fleshly realm, in the carnal realm. And so we don't live down here, but we lift up our eyes and we think about eternal realities, eternal verities, not just the here and the now. I forgot this at the last sermon, but the reason I started out with Peter the Pumpkin Eater is this. Jim Elliott was a young man at Wheaton College back in the 1940s, early 50s, and his plan for his life, you want to get God to laugh, tell him what your plan for your life is. Um, but his plan for his life is, I'm going to go to South America, and I'm going to reach the cannibalistic, unreached peoples that live in the jungles of Ecuador. And so he's studying and preparing for this life as a missionary. He wrote in his journal that the only one who could do this job is, is, is a single unattached person because they don't have all the worries of this world. Sadly for Jim, he met a young woman named Elizabeth, and he fell in love. And now he's got this conundrum. He's got this problem, this, this conflict going on within him. And so he writes in his journal, again, that the only one who's fit to go out as a missionary is one who is unencumbered because it's perilous, because it's precarious. You can't ask a wife and a family to go with you. And then he writes, and this is the part that I love, 
you end up with Peter the Pumpkin Eater's proverbial uh, problem. So he says, look, you got a wife. She's not going to be content living in a pumpkin shell. She's going to want a house. And if you have a house, you're going to need rugs, and you're going to need curtains. And if you have a house, you're going to have a bedroom and a bathroom, and you're going to need uh, linens and towels. And if you've got a kitchen in your house, you're going to need plates and knives and forks and placemats and tables and chairs. And the more that you meet all of those needs, it just never ends. It continues to cascade. Next thing you know, you've got a car. And if you've got a car, now you've got to have a garage. And to build a garage, you've got to have land. And if you've got land, you've got a garden. And if you've got a garden, well, you've got to have have a rake and a hoe and a shovel and you need a shed to put it in and it just never comes to an end and then he says whoa 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 is the man who would live such an entangled encumbered life doesn't have any of that stuff out on the mission field now if you don't know Jim Elliott and you don't know the story I think they took them after the 8 o'clock service, but we have two copies of The Shadow of the Almighty written by his wife. He did marry her, Elizabeth Elliot. Um, Shadow of the Almighty, or um, what's the other one? Sorry? Through Gates of Splendor. Um, so he's, Elizabeth has written lots of books, but those are the two that primarily deal with this, this story that we're talking about here. That also is what Paul is trying to get at. We get so focused on our raiment, our clothing, our, sh our shelter, the roof over our head, over keeping up with the Joneses. And we get so focused on these earthly things that we lose all perspective on the stuff that matters. And so he wants us to get with the program here. There was a priest, and he was teaching his religion class to a bunch of about 24th graders, and he asked the question, who wants to go to heaven? And 19 of the 20 little children raised their hands. You see how that goes up here. But little Johnny didn't raise his hand. And so the priest said, well, little Johnny, do you want to go to heaven? And little Johnny said, yeah, I want to go to heaven. Well, why didn't you raise your hand? Well, I thought you wanted to go right now. <laughs> it's inconvenient to go right now. And that's what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 7. You want to get married and you want to pursue uh, the American dream and have a middle class existence and a house in the suburbs and a car in the garage. And it isn't convenient to do those things. Why? Because in verse 29, the time is short. Paul believed that, uh, that Jesus could return literally at any moment. If tomorrow you knew for certain that the day of the Lord was to come and Jesus would descend, would your life be different? Would your priorities be different? Would you have different convictions and would your behavior change? And, and would you start talking to your neighbors and your family about Jesus because he's coming back tomorrow and you better be on the right side of him when he shows up? Um, all of those things, this is the point that Paul's trying to make. The questions he's getting bombarded with are questions, you know, young virgins. What do they want? They want to get married. They want to have babies, particularly in that culture. There's all this pressure to be born by these young women. As soon as you hit puberty, you get married and you start popping out babies because there's no social security. Those babies are your social security. And, and there's pressure from your parents to do this. And there's pressure from the culture to do this. And Paul is saying, you've got to take a step back that all this pressure and all of these priorities are worldly pressures and worldly priorities. If you have a wife, now here's the thing, all of the things that Paul lists, he considers to be good and true and noble. So marriage is a noble thing. Paul's not mocking marriage or saying don't get married. But if you have a wife, act as if you, you don't have a wife. If you're mourning your mother, act as if you don't have a mother. If you're a businessman, act as if life doesn't rise and fall with your business prospects. Keep things in a healthy perspective. Hold things in an, uh, an appropriate balance. Now, there's something else going on that we don't see in our text, but it's the history of the place and time. Paul left Corinth about 51 AD. And about the time that he left, and for several years until the time in which he wrote the letter that we're looking at, there, be, there came a famine on the land. The, the wheat crops failed. And so that was a huge deal. The whole of the Roman Empire was living under a big question mark. And the question is this. 
Pax Romana, the Roman peace. We've got aqueducts bringing in clean water. We have sewers taking away sewage. We have the, the Roman roads. We have Roman legions that are keeping the peace so that business can flourish. And the people have been promised bread and circuses. And now there's no bread. And the social contract is broken. And people are wondering, what does this mean? And what's going on? Is this the end of the world? That's the pagan question that they're asking. Is this the end of the world? And Christians, and Paul is encouraging them to do this, are thinking, today could be the day of the Lord, or tomorrow could be the day of the Lord. What in the Lord's name is going on here? And imagine a famine uh, on the poor. The rich always get their share. They get what they need. They get their bread. They get their grain. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, a significant portion of the church in Corinth was poor. And so they're struggling to make ends meet. And their parents are placing all this pressure on the young girls to get married and have babies. And, and in this time of uncertainty, they don't know if they can feed themselves, let alone a brood of children. And so Paul, this is the backdrop, and Paul is trying to encourage them. Essentially, he's saying, in a time of crisis, don't make any significant major life decisions. Wait. Maintain the status quo more than that, though and serve the Lord. Each one of you has been given at least one and some more than one spiritual gift. And so you utilize that spiritual gift for the work of God in the world. Emphasize and focus and spend your en energy on the kingdom of God, not on the American dream and a house in the suburbs with a white picket fence and a BMW in the driveway. You have a choice in the matter, and Paul is calling on them to, have, to take the eternal perspective, to look beyond the here and now. So if you've got a wife, act as if you don't have one. If you're mourning, act as if you're not mourning. If you're doing business, act as if the business isn't the be-all and the end-all of the universe. That's what Paul wants the church to understand. Again, with the complete expectation that Jesus could return at any moment. Jesus put the same thing this way in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, Seek first God and His righteousness, or His kingdom. Seek first God and His kingdom, and the rest of this stuff will take care of itself. That's what Paul is trying to communicate. So you've been given a gift. You've been given a ministry. You've been given a job to do. Do the job and don't worry about these other things. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and the other things will take care of themselves. Because why? What Lynn shared with the kids, that God is faithful, that God can be trusted. Trials come and trials go. Pains come and pains go. But in the midst of all of that, God is faithful. God shows up. Maintain your relationship with God and serve God to the building up of his kingdom. That's why we're here. That's the purpose of our lives. It transcends what we do for a living. It transcends where we live, what neighborhood we live in, what kind of car we drive. It transcends all of those things. Pursue Christ. Put him first. That's Paul's call to these people who are asking legitimate questions. He's not mocking a girl's desire to get married and have children. He's not mocking that at all. But he's saying that life is bigger and greater and, and grander than that and that God has plans and purposes for you. And he does for you as well. Amen.